uh, Dr. James Maxwell, uh, humble servant of the Lord and vice president here uh, at Southwestern for Institutional Expansion. He's a great gospel preacher, served as minister of several congregations and churches of Christ. He now serves as minister emeritus in Kansas City, Kansas. He's had numerous debates over the years, and he is certainly no stranger on the polemical platform. And so uh, he will be speaking, and also uh, Dr. Jack Evans, who needs no introduction at all, humble servant of the Lord, and we know of his reputation. And uh, great gospel preacher, National Crusade speaker, and uh, president of Southwestern Christian College prolific writer, prolific gifted debater, and he's engaged in several debates, and uh, he enjoys being able to show the difference between truth and error. And out of all of the debates, uh, he's never lost a debate. Uh, he's never lost a debate. Uh, he's never lost a debate. Now, the best thing for me to do now is to just get out the way and let them come with the rebuttal. In this segment, Bishop Nathaniel of Israel United in Christ is going to prove using the Bible that the so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans make up the 12 tribes of Israel. Are we ready with the uh, PowerPoint? I want to open up with Isaiah 41 and 21. Uh, we first need to make our statement regarding what we teach. Some of you may have heard of Israel United in Christ. Some of you may have not have heard about us and what we teach. Uh, since the time of slavery, the black man and black woman, Latin man and Latin woman has had no identity. And when I say no identity, we have had no basis of nationality. We went into slavery being called Negroes, niggers, coons, things of that nature. It wasn't until the 80s we became blacks. I believe in the 70s we were called Afro-Americans. Our identities have changed every 10 or so years. I want to open up with Isaiah the 41st chapter and the 21st verse first and foremost. The book of Isaiah, chapter 41 and verse 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. The Bible says produce your cause, saith the Lord. Go ahead. Bring forth your strong reason. Whatever you state, whatever we state in Israel not in Christ, whatever they state, you must bring forth your cause, bring forth your strong reasoning. Prove what you say. Go ahead. Bring forth your strong reasons. Bring forth saith. your strong reasons. Go ahead. Saith the king of Jacob. Uh-huh. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Listen good. Let them bring it forth and tell us what shall happen. For too long, we have been in the church of Christianity. Nationless. No identity. And we've asked, where are we? Jesse Jackson often, he's famous for saying, we are. Well, he's saying, I am somebody. And we're, well, who are we? Some of us say we're black. Some of us Afro-American. Some of us this. Some of us that. The Bible says, bring forth your strong reason, produce your cause. Tell us what shall what, read the part again. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them tell us what shall happen. How did the black man and black woman get in the condition of they are, that they are today? How did we get into slavery and why? Show us according to the Bible. That's the question the black youth have. What happened and why, read. Let them show the former things. Let them show, let the preachers say the former things, meaning what happened in the past to get us to where we are today. Go ahead. What they be. What they be. That we may consider them. That we may consider them. Go ahead. And know the latter end of them. And knowing the latter end of things. This is what you're going to find out today and tomorrow. You're going to find out who you are according to the Bible. You're going to find out where you come from, where we, how we got here today, and where we're going as a people. Was that it, Captain? To declare us things for to come. Declare unto us things for to come. This is what the Christian church has not done. Declare unto us things for to come. 
What is happening in America today? Why are black men getting killed and incarcerated at a phenomenal rate? Why, why, why? Why do we have identities? Why is there no unity among us? Why? Come on. Verse 23. Show the things that are to come hereafter. Show us the things that are here to come hereafter. Go ahead. That we may know. That we may know. That we are gods. That we are gods. Come on. Yea, to do good. To do good. Or do evil. Or do evil. That we may be dismayed and behold it together. So the point of it all is what we're going to share with you all. Who you are as a people. Where you come from. Why we're in the condition today. You have to understand that first. Uh, is the PowerPoint presentation ready? Okay. I want to open up with Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. The Bible says, produce your cause, bring forth your strong reasoning. I'm going to identify. First, exactly, give me Deuteronomy 1 and 1. Let's see who Moses is speaking with. Come on. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1 and verse 1. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel. I want everyone in this room to hear what we are saying. Moses is speaking to the Israelites. Now go to Deuteronomy 28 and verse 15. This is during the exodus from Egypt, northeast Africa. Come on. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 15. But it shall come to pass... If thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. But it shall come to pass if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. Read. To observe to do all his commandments. To observe to do all his commandments. Not religions, commandments. Come on. And his statutes, uh -huh. which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So Moses is telling the Israelites, if you break God's commandments, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, I'm just going to hit key points out of the 28th chapter. Uh, Bezalel, I want verse 32, please. Put th verse 32 on the screen. Come on. That's 16. I just want key points. We can go through the whole chapter, but I know I'm short for time. Read verse 32 for me. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 32. This is one of the curses that came upon the Israelites. Listen. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people. Thy sons, if you break God's commandments, remember that point. Your sons and your daughters shall be given unto another people. Come on. And thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. And your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long. Go ahead. And there shall be no might in thine hand. There shall be no might in your hand, meaning no economic might, no military might to unite your people. Go ahead. Verse 33. No, jump down to verse 48. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 48. Therefore thou shalt serve thine enemies. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies. Go ahead. Which the Lord shall send against thee. Which the Lord shall send against thee. In hunger. In hunger, you gotta serve your enemies. Keep operative word, your enemies. In hunger. And in thirst. And in thirst, meaning water, come on. And in nakedness. Nakedness means clothes for your body. You gotta go to your enemies, come on. And in want of all things. If you want anything, education, to be buried, you must go to your enemies. If you even want toilet paper, black man, black woman, you have to go to your enemies. Everybody understand that? We don't? And he shall put a yoke. Read it slow. I want, don't read this past. Read slow. And he, and he, meaning your enemies, shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Until he hath destroyed Until he hath destroyed thee. In slavery, if you know anything about slavery, we had yokes of iron upon our necks. If you've ever seen the movie Roots, Mandingo, or Drums, or even 12 Years a Slave, they showed that. We had yokes of iron on our neck. Do you see the bottom left? That's a photograph, not a drawing. The bottom left is a photograph taken in the late 1700s, early 1800s. A photograph. So what are we reading? The Bible. When was that prophesied? 3,000 years ago. But we did not believe Moses. We said, we're the mightiest nation. God destroyed Pharaoh for us. Moses, you telling us we're going to be slaves if, you break, if we break God's laws? Ha! We didn't believe nothing Moses said. Look what happened. Did that happen to us? You better believe that happened to us. What are we reading? The Bible. Jump to verse 68 now. 
The book of Deuteronomy. Wait a minute. Read 48 again. I'm sorry. 48. One more time. There's something I wanted. Verse 48. Therefore shall thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger. In hunger. And in thirst. Come on. And in nakedness. Uh-huh. And in want of all things. Here it comes. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck. Hear it again. Listen good. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon your neck. Until he hath destroyed thee. Until. Until he hath destroyed thee. Until. When did the, none of us in here got yokes of iron on our neck. When did the yokes come off? When did they take the yoke of iron off? When we were destroyed as a people. How? Mentally destroyed. It's like if you ever own an animal and you put a leash on it, you, after X amount of time, that dog or that cat or whatever animal it is, will only go but so far to where that leash or that yoke allowed it. So when we were all emancipated, that meant we were destroyed already. How? How are we destroyed mentally and spiritually? In religions. World religions. Some of us Muslims, some of us Baptists, some of us Pentecostal. It divided us up. Watch this. Verse 68, please. Come on. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 68. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. Stop. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. The word Egypt is synonymous for bondage when you read Exodus 20. I'm going to say it again. The word Egypt is synonymous for bondage, meaning slavery. Read it again. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. With what? With ships. And the Lord shall bring you into bondage again with ships. You, you can check worldwide what race of people went into slavery on ships. You don't got to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. That happened to our people. It didn't happen to the Chinese. It sure as heck. Heck, I said heck, did not happen to the so-called white man in Israel. He never went into slavery on ships, the one that claimed to be Jews. He didn't have yokes of iron on his neck until he was destroyed. That's our people. What are we reading? The Bible. What, is the, what are we proving? We are the people of the book. We are the Israelites. Read it again. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. What kind of ships? Cargo slave ships. Come on. By the way whereof I spake unto thee. By the way Moses said it would happen, that's the way it happened. Come on. And thou shalt see it no more again. Your identity, your homeland. Come on. And there. And there once you got off the slave ships. Let's see what would happen. What did Moses say would happen? Come on. Ye shall be sold unto your enemies. You shall be sold unto your enemy. Auction slave blocks. Like I said, any of you, you can get an eight-year-old who goes to school and go, Daddy, that happened to us. My history teacher taught us we were sold on slave ships. You better believe it. What are we proving? We are the people of the book. We are the biblical Israelites. We are the real Israelites. Not no spiritual. We are the real deal. Read it again. And there ye shall be sold unto your enemies. Sold unto who? Your enemies. Friends. Your enemies. Friends. Your enemies. Mm, this is the Bible. We're not going to add no words to it. So you shall be sold to your enemies. Come on. For bond men, slave men, and bond women, slave women, and no man shall buy you. No man shall buy you. Jump up to verse 37. This is something I forgot in that chapter. So, what have we proven so far? Moses told the Israelites, if you break God's laws, you'll go into slavery on ships, you'll be sold to your enemies, and you would have yokes of iron on your neck. Your sons and daughters would be taken from you and given to another people. This is our history. I don't care how you feel about us. This is our history. No church on the earth set up by America or Britain has been ordained to teach this history. They don't know this according to the Bible. We all grew up in Sunday school. We all grew up in church. I am a preacher. We're the child of God. Well, we wouldn't mean we're the child of God. God made all nations. Well, which one are we? There's over 18 nations in there. Which one are we? I, please help me, preacher. I don't know. Now we're finding out. Deuteronomy 20, verse 37, watch this. Verse 37, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whether the Lord shall lead thee. What does it mean we would become a proverb and a byword? As the children of Israel, our name was Judah, Benjamin, Levi, Gad, Reuben. God gave us identity. When we went into slavery, we became proverbs and bywords. Let's name some. Negro. Or the first word, excuse me, nigger. That's what they called us initially. Niggas, that's a byword. You're being called outside your God-given name. 
they changed all our identities. For example, I see four people right here in the front row. They send you to America, her to Jamaica, her to Haiti, her to Brazil. Now you think you're strangers. You call Afro-American, West Indian black, Haitian, and Brazilian. You speak Portuguese, you speak French, you got a Creole, divided us up. They changed our family names. If your name is Wilson, for example, Wilson, Jackson, whatever your last name is, ask yourself where it come from. The slave master branded his ownership in your back and you became Wilson, Jones, um, give me some more names, Thompson, all that. Notice, go back, come on, somebody, it's a proverb right there. Black, African-American, West Indian, those are proverbs and bywords. Latinos, Puerto Rican, Cubans, all those are proverbs and bywords. They gave us Gentile names. They made us Gentiles. Everybody understand that? They said, you're no longer the children of Israel. Give them Gentile names. And they, we were forced to assimilate. This is what it means by being a proverb and a byword. We became Gentiles here in America. No longer the Israelites. Just like it says in 2 Maccabees. Can we get, can we, do we have time for that? 2 Maccabees, I got five minutes, give me that 2 Maccabees. I'm gonna prove what I say. 2 Maccabees, give me uh, chapter six, six through nine, quickly. The Bible speaks for itself. What happened to us here in America happened to us from the time of the Greeks, from the time of Babylon, time of Persia media, time of Rome. Watch this, come on. The book of 2 Maccabees, chapter six, verse six. Neither was it lawful for a man to keep Sabbath days or ancient feasts or to profess himself at all to be a Jew. It was against the law, Greek law. The Greeks said, you can't call yourself Jews no more. Read. And in the day of the king's birth, every month, every, they were brought by bitter constraint to eat of the sacrifice. They forced us to celebrate the king's birthday. Come on, quickly. And when the feast of Bacchus was kept, the Jews were compelled to go in procession to Bacchus. Read. Carrying ivy. Moreover, there went out a decree to Listen the neighboring... Listen to this. Moreover, there went out a decree... To the neighboring cities of the heathen by the suggestion of Ptolemy against the Jews that they should observe the same fashion. They forced us to observe Greek fashions and be partakers of their sacrifices. Uh-huh. And whosoever would not conform themselves to the manner of the Gentiles. Whoever, whichever of the Israelites would not become a Gentile. Read that line again. And whoso would not conform themselves to the manner of the Gentiles should be put to death. They killed us. If we did not become Gentiles, they killed us. The same thing that happened during the time of the Greeks in Rome happened here in America. When they changed our identities, our family names, and forced Greco-Roman customs on us, like Christmas. I said it, like Christmas. That is not a biblical holiday to keep. I bet your pastors never taught y'all that either. Christmas is pagan. It's of the devil. That's right, I said it. And we can, what we say, we can prove according to the Bible. How much time I got? Three minutes. Give me 2 Maccabees 4, uh, about the Greek is fashion. Come on. The book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 4 and verse 9. Besides this, he promised to assign 150 more, if he might have license to set them up a place for exercise and for the training up of the youth in the fashion of the heathen, and to write them in Jerusalem by the name of Antiochians, uh -huh. which, when the, which when the king had granted, and he had gotten into his hand the rule, he forthwith brought his own nation to the Greekish fashion. He brought us to the Greek fashion. So they gave us Greek. This is why when you read the New Testament, you read about people like Timothy, whose father was a Greek. You read about things of that nature, the Greeks, where Paul says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, because the history is they forced the Israelites to become Greeks, just like here in America. Now we're proud Afro or African Americans, okay? Give me, go back now, before we started, Isaiah 41, 21. Come on. Let's go right back to, we started there with this one, we're gonna go right back here. So what are we proving to you? What have we proven thus far? Our identity. We're not Afro-American, we're not West Indian, we're not Haitian. These are labels the white man put us, on us in slavery. Ask your churches, which race are we in the Bible? Are we the Philistines? Are we the Edomites? Are we the Moabites? Which one are we? We're telling you we're the Israelites, as we just proved. Come on, read it again. The book of Isaiah, chapter 41 and verse 21. 
Produce your call. So anybody that says we are just a child of God, which child of God? Which race? God made all races. Which one are we? Come on. Produce your call. Produce your call, saith the Lord. Come on. Bring forth your strong reasons. Bring forth your strong reasons. Saith the king of Jacob. Saith the king of Jacob. Jacob is our father. Come on. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Show us what shall happen. This is what we've done in a short time. We showed you why we went into slavery. Because we broke God's commandments. We showed you what would happen to us. We would go into slavery on ships, have yokes of iron on our neck. Our sons and daughters would be taken from us, given to another people. We can prove our history in the Bible. Ask these Christians, where's our history? Come on. Let them show the former things. Show us the former things. We've showed you the former things. Come on. What they be. What they be. That we may consider. That we may consider. Come on. And know the latter end of them. And know the latter end. This is where we're at now. You need to know the latter end. Now, the bishop did an excellent job of proving that the blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans make up the 12 tribes of Israel, according to the Bible. And he used Bible scriptures to explain that. But what I want you to realize in this next segment, and what I want you to notice is that the leaders of Southwestern Christian College didn't really rebuttal or have anything to say about the curses that were in Deuteronomy 28 and the point that the bishop brought up. In fact, he even stated that he had no clue what the bishop was talking about. Brother Foster said let them come as they're called. He talked, he called Brother Maxwell first, but I don't look like Brother Maxwell. <laughs> I'm better looking. <laughs> We're very happy to have all of you here as our guests, really. Even those with whom we disagree on some things, you're still our guests. We're happy to have you, and we're not here to uh, act like we are enemies. We are not enemies. Uh, we are all, I believe, interested in doing what God wants us to do. And if we're not interested in that, then we're wasting our time. Now, I'm not going to try to answer everything that has already been said because I didn't understand everything that was being said. Now, I'm not going to try to answer everything that has already been said because I didn't understand everything that was being said. Did you guys hear that? The pastor stated that he had no idea what the bishop was talking about, about who the children of Israel were. Did he never read about the children of Israel in the Bible? Let's continue. It's been said. I'm going to show you that in a debate, you must have a defined proposition, and then you must have a defined authority. And the authority to support the proposition is the Bible. Now, you can't just run all over the Bible and grab this and that. Okay, remember, I want to touch upon one more thing that Jumper said. We jump around the Bible from here, there, everywhere. Let's see if that's what the Bible says to do. Isaiah 28, speed it up. One minute. The book of Isaiah, chapter 28, and verse 9, read. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand knowledge? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Read. For precept must be upon precept. Read, Pastor. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. That's how God had the Bible. It's not meant to be read like a, like a, like a novel book. He put the script, he put it all over the body, and then he's going to send the prophets who can decide the word. Don't be confused. Listen, pay attention to what's being said. And it doesn't have any, uh, uh, anything to do with some of the things you're talking about. So I'm going to just start in, in 2 Timothy 3 and just see if we can get into the Bible and, and see what the Bible is saying about the positions that uh, we hold. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 uh, I want to begin with verse 13. 
We have readers too, but I have to uh, let you know that we are not interested in looking like each other because I don't want to look like you. <laughs> I don't want you looking like me. We want to look like Jesus. We want to be in the image of the Son of God. And we're not here to emphasize physical characteristics because all of us are going right back to the dust from whence we came. Now I want you to notice how he states that he's concerned with looking like Jesus and being made in the image of Jesus, right? But then he goes on to say that he's not concerned with the physical appearance of things. Doesn't looking like someone mean that you physically appear to look like that person? If Jesus Christ is a black man, wouldn't you want to be made in the image of Christ like a black man and look like him? Or better yet, wouldn't you think our people would be concerned that knowing that Christ looked like them as described in the book of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 14? But let's continue. So there's no need of, of, of trying to highlight a race a physical race or color, let's just look at Jesus. And what does Jesus want us to do in trying to take the world for God? Now in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, uh, the Bible says, But evil men and seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We can see this going on in the world today. Evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, and times are getting worse and worse. But then listen to what Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. You see, you have to learn before you can speak. Continue in the things you've learned. And he's going to tell us what we have learned. And you have been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know where it came from. And that from a child. Timothy, Paul tells him, you have known what? The Holy Scripture. We have come here to talk about the Holy Scripture and to learn what God wants us to know about life. Not to argue, we're friends now and we'll be friends when it's over. But the point is, we must learn how, how to take God's word and show that we are striving to be like Jesus. Amen. He sent Christ into the world. God sent Christ into the world that men might be saved. Now, being alike simply means we must all live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It doesn't matter about your color. Amen, Walls. It doesn't matter about language, your, your, your language you speak, or the community you live in. God looks on the inside of us. And that's what we are going to talk about in this debate as far as we are concerned because the Bible emphasizes with our imbibing the spirit of Christ. Yes, sir. Come on, sir. Come on. You don't come out fighting. Come on. We haven't come here to fight like that. Come on. We have come here to demonstrate that we belong to God and God knows what's best for all of us. So he said here, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now the reason some men not are waxed uh, worse and worse 
is because they don't know the Holy Scripture. Now, when you know the Holy Scripture, you you don't have to uh, try to use the uh, ways that people are living today, or how we are, uh, are segregated, or, or how we are integrated. You don't have to use that if you know the Holy Scripture. Because you, a man is only better than another man when he lives a better life. And that's what Christianity is all about. Live for God. Alright? And Paul tells Timothy, you've known this from a child. You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able, now notice what's going to be doing. The Holy Scriptures, not just Scripture. You know, anything that's written is Scripture. But the Holy Scripture. Now listen, you've known the Holy Scripture which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. You have your letter on that too. Read it, read the one of you. Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Unto salvation through faith. All right. Which is, which is in where? Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Yes, sir. And Western Christian College is about what Christ Jesus teaches. Yes, sir. Not what man himself has come up with. I've debated, as you know, men all over this country, including the so-called people in Chicago who follow uh, Mohammed. We had it in Fort Worth, hundreds and thousands of people. But the point is, I was not interested in what man says. We have to say what the Holy Scripture says. And you know what we do here at this college? We instill in these young people what the Holy Scripture teaches. Not hatred, not anger, what the Holy Scripture teaches, and we strive to live like Jesus wants us to live. And from a child, you have known this, Paul is telling uh, uh, this young man, uh, Timothy, you've known from a child, and some of us haven't known this from a child. We grab something up in age when someone has made us angry. And we want to talk about the other race and all of that. God looks at all of us as his children when we obey him as the Father. Live a better life and you'll be better than I am. And I, if I live a better life than you, I'll be better than you. But not because of my color. Not because I'm black. Not because you're white. It's on the inside. Now, keep reading. Let's see. Which are able to make you wise. And the scripture will make you wise into what? Salvation. Salvation. From the faith. Come on. Which is faith. In you have to have Jesus. faith. Come on, sir. Come on. Faith must be in there somewhere. Yes, sir. Let's not become hate mongers. We have too much hate in this world right now. Look at Orlando. A man down there just killing people, shooting the truth. That's hate. God doesn't want that. Get my yeah. Whew. Now he said a lot, and it sounded good, but if you notice, he did just like most of our pastors do today. He said a lot of things, but he didn't give us any scriptures to back up his key points. For instance, he talked about how we were preaching hate and about how he follows Christ, right? He also even stated that some scripture is just scripture, and some scripture is holy scripture. I mean, what does that mean? What scripture do you have to back up that statement that you just said? Let's see the rebuttal from Israel United in Christ and Bishop Kanani. I want to press something real quick the time I got six minutes. Okay, they said, uh, we're preaching hate. God is about love, which he is. It was a time and season of everything. Let's see. 
what the prophets said concerning that. Give me, uh, I believe it is, I wrote it down someplace here. Uh, Psalms 139. Help me out if I'm wrong. Psalm 139. Verse 21. Uh, yes. The book of Psalms, chapter 139, and verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord. This is David speaking. He said, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. So, is this wrong? Read on. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Are we not grieved with those that rise up against them? The gentleman said, he made a comment that we're supposed to have love, and what happened in, our, in our Orlando was hate. That was God's will. God said, I make a lie that I care. They were reveling. Now, do we wish death on anybody? No. But there was a mist of reveling. Drunken, homosexuality. God brought judgment on the earth like he's done for generations after generations against the ungodly. It's not a hate speech. Why do you think it's hate? Because you hear the actors in a tone of a voice. But this is how the prophets spoke. They spoke direct, clear with God's word. Read on. I hate them with the perfect hatred. Wait a second. The statement was like, you're not supposed to hate. The Bible said here, David said that he hate them with a perfect hatred. Now, do, do we hate all brothers here? No. We understand many people are asleep. We don't wish death on people. We don't wish harm on people. But we know the urgency of God. We know it's time for people to come out of the line. The Christian church, and really you're not Christians, the real Christians are us. The ones who follow Christ, keep the Sabbath day, keep the Passover, roll their beards, women in dresses, the laws of God. The true Christians will follow Christ. What you follow is a religion called Christianity. Talk to you. It's not the true teachings of Christ. For, uh, give me uh, Luke 1, 67. I want you all to be taking notes. Luke 1, 67. The book of Luke, chapter 1, and verse... 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost. Wait a second. This is John the Baptist's father, Zacharias. And it said he was filled with what? The Holy Ghost. So we can say, we say that God has inspired him. If he's filled with the Holy Ghost, we don't. And prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. That he visited and redeemed his people. How did he visit us? And redeemed his people, his possessive pronoun, his people by sending his son Jesus to Christ to die for us. We are. And have raised up an horn of salvation for us, for everyone. For us, for us, we are. In the house of his servant David, we are. As he spoke by the mouth of all his holy prophets in the past, all the prophets of the Old Testament, Moses, Deuteronomy 16, 16, or 18, 18. Uh, Isaiah 53, all the prophets, signs, all they all spoke about the coming of the Messiah, we are, which have been since the world began, we, that we, that we should be, should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Who hated the Israelites in the time here? It was the Romans, they ain't known as Italians, Caucasian white people, the Bible calls it here. That we should be, hate, be saved from the hand of all that hate us. That that document you think you believe in was taught to you by the slave master. Hmm. That's where you got it from. That's why we have white Christian church and black Christian church today. God has separated nations in the beginning of the time of the Tower of Babylon. He separated nations, they're never coming back together. <laughs> got he. <laughs> got he. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of the Lord. It says what? All scripture. All scripture. All scripture. Look, 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 look at this. Somebody come look at this. Look at this. Somebody come and look at this. Look at this. Do y'all see this?
I mean, not too long ago, he stated that some scripture is just scripture and some scripture is holy scripture, which we know that's nowhere in the Bible. But now he's saying all scripture. So what about all the scriptures about the children of Israel going into slavery on slave ships? Is that not all scriptures? If you remember, he stated earlier about he didn't know what Bishop was talking about, the curses that will fall upon the children of Israel. Is that not all scripture? Clearly, he's picking and choosing what things he wants to touch on. What do we need to follow? Someone said the Constitution. Not necessarily. Because the Constitution can be misinterpreted. And for many years, black people were held down because of what's in the Constitution. The Supreme Court had to come along and reinterpret and say that America is for all people, not just for white people. Many white people didn't like that, but we still. I remember um, watching a television show when the, when the man who was in charge of it asked um, when black kids were beginning to go to to the schools when the schools were being integrated and what well, old white man said I know with those black children going mixing with our children I know my uh, old pappy is just turning over in his grave I said well let him turn over and just say that because we don't need hatred trying to fight hatred and that includes black racism, white racism, yellow racism, any kind of racism is not pleasing to God. Read. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. Now you have to have authority when you debate. What is the authority? Someone says, oh, scripture. Well, now, all scripture here has reference to Holy Scripture. You, know, you say anything written is Scripture, but Holy Scripture, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God. It has to come from God. Why? Because God knows what we need more than we know ourselves. These concoctions by me, and they're going to say you superior because you're certain on a certain color or you speak a certain language mean nothing. It's what God says. All scripture is given by inspiration. By the inspiration of God. And is profitable. And I notice it's profitable for doctrine. For doctrine only. Now we're church people, so if you're gonna have doctrine God said, I'm giving you a book for it. Amen. It's scripture. It's not what the leader of a movement wrote for the people. These are the people I debated. I debated these people, not, not this group here, but uh, others who, who tried to instill the same hatred in the hearts of the listeners that they had in their hearts. Some of you were at these debates. And so it is that, read it again. All scripture is given by his All scripture. Here's the authority. And it's scripture. So what we want in this debate, even if you want to call it that, is not lift the script. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Come here, man. Come on. And don't just read anything in the Bible. You have to put it in context. Yeah. We visit uh, Deuteronomy 28 just for a second. Anyway, in case, uh, Captain, can you read verse 48 for us, please? The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and verse 48. Therefore, shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee. In hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he hath destroyed thee. Um, 
I don't see how you can take that out of context. It said the children of Israel would go on slavery, they would have yokes of iron on their neck. That happened to us, historically. Year 1619, 1620. You can read verse 68, please. I want to touch on this just because in case someone on this side says, oh, you guys are taking that out of context. It happened to the Chinese. I want to read the book where the Chinese had yokes of iron on their neck. Verse 68. Verse 68. And the Lord shall bring me into Egypt again with ships. We're in Egypt with bondage. And the Lord shall bring me into bondage again with what? With ships. Come on. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again. And then you shall be sold. And then, once you get off those ships, and then you shall be sold unto your enemies. For bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. That happened to us. I don't see how you can take that out of context. You'll go into slavery on ships and be sold for bond men and bond women. That only happened to us. You have to, if, if you're saying it's out of context, what? Show me where the, the white man went into slavery on ships. Where is that nation? Where is the Chinese with the slavery on ships? Where is that? Where is the East Indian? So if we're taking it, we are not taking it out of context. All scripture, and the scripture does not contradict itself. That's right. The scripture doesn't tell you you can hate people. God hates sin. And people who love people don't hate people. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for, for doctrine. Profitable for what? Doctrine. Doctrine. You want doctrine to govern your religious organization? The scripture. The Holy Scripture. And that's why we, in churches of Christ, hold on to the Holy Scripture. Mm -hmm. The Holy Scripture. Now here, I have a book here, the Septuagint, with Apocrypha, Greek, and English. Now the point is, if God has given us a book, that is profitable for doctrine. Why do we need another book? Mm -hmm. You want doctrine? Why do you need another book? If God knows what he's doing when he says, I'm giving you your book here. I made you. I know what you need. Now, profitable for doctrine? For correction. Correction! You want to correct me? Don't run over there and grab a, a gun. The book. The book. Keep reading. What else? For instruction what? in righteousness. Instruction in righteousness. Come on. That the man of said, God. God gave it this to us so the man of God may be perfect. The man of God. You can't be a man of God hating other races. You can't be a woman of God. Some, I know some women will say, well, I'm glad he said man. Man. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I know you know better than that, but that's generic. That the man of God may be perfect. May be perfect. Thoroughly furnished. Thoroughly what? Furnished. Furnished. Come on. Unto all good works. Unto all good works. Amen. Friends, if we're going to serve God, we're going to have to say what God says. Amen. And anybody who doesn't say what God says and claim to be leading people right, I challenge. I challenge because God is right. And he tells us how to treat one another, to respect one another, and it's not based on color. Now, someone says, you mean you're going to say that here through the debate? Yes. I'm the president here. And I'm going to say what I believe as a Christian. 
And I believe that God has given us a perfect book for a perfect life if we want to live it. No man can outdo the Holy Spirit in writing what man needs. All scripture. And someone says, well, well, uh, that means anything written. No, not anything written. What about that in uh, the uh, sexology books? Written. That's scripture. But to remember, it must be holy scripture. Mm -hmm. And when we learn, when we learn that God is in charge, we'll have a better world. And we will not have people just killing one another as we have seen recently in Orlando, Florida, just shooting people down in other places of the world. And we create the atmosphere for hatred when we try to box it into ourselves, we're the only ones right because we are going to show people, you know, don't mess with us. God says, you must have the spirit of Christ. Right. And if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he's none of him. Now you've come to the right place if you want to hear what Southwestern Christian College believes. This is what we instill in our young people here at Southwestern. The Bible is right. The Bible is right because all scripture given by the inspiration of God. Profitable for doctrine. For you want to reprove somebody? Reproof. Instruction in righteousness. Is my time up? Yes, sir. Yeah, you have 20 seconds. Well, you better talk to it. 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be back. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Israel, give me uh, Deuteronomy. Don't give me Matthew uh, 15, 24. I saw that I know. Salvation for Israel. The reason many of us fight and say that salvation is for everybody is because we don't know who we are. Believe me, when you realize that you are Israel, that you're the people of Moses, the people of Christ, the people of Peter, James, and John, you're going to take your heels three times and praise the Lord. <laughs> the book of Matthew, chapter 15, and verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Christ said he's only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Why are we lost? We don't know who we are today. We don't know our racial identity. We don't know where we come from. We are the lost sheep. And the word but means only. Read it again, please, please, please. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as we know, the Bible does not contradict itself. It, it does not contradict itself. Man contradicts the Bible. Uh, real quick, give me Acts 5, 29 to 30, please. Because some, we have met some Christians that said, after Christ's death and resurrection, he came for all men. Acts 5, 29 and 30. The book of Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. Come on. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Mm -hmm. Him had God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel. To who? To Israel. Uh -huh. And forgiveness of sin. So Peter stood up and said, You want you better obey God rather than man. The Lord raised up Jesus on you soon to be a prince and a savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. We need to know that we're Israel. We don't realize that we've been running around in these false nationalities for too long. Haitian. Guyanese, Trinidadian, Puerto Rican, Cuban. These are labels our oppressors put on us. But now it's high time for us to wake up and realize we are the biblical Israelites. Give me um, John 3, 16. And Bezalel, please, on the screen, I want John 3, 16. Because this is the most famous scripture that Christians run through. 
Remember, I'm going to sum it up, I'm going to sum it up, I'm going to sum it up. Christ is speaking to Nicodemus, a Jew. He's from verse 1 down, he's talking to a Jew, a fellow Israelite. Now, uh, we have the world in the I want, I want that, that slide. I need it up on the screen. The world. I need it up there. Okay, give me John 3. Let's go, let's go, how about we do this? Let's go a few verses about it. Verse 14. The book of John, chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So, I wanted to stop there for a reason. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Give me the piece up in Numbers, uh, chapters of 29 and all. 21, thank you, thank you. Let's see what Christ is talking about. Let's see what he is talking about. <coughs> the book of Numbers, chapter 21 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. Make thee a fiery serpent. Right. And send it upon a pole. And send it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass mm. that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Come on. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass. And if a serpent had bitten any man, when he had, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Mm -hmm. Read about it. I want the point where the serpent died. My verse, verse six. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. That's what I wanted. Much people of the Israelites died. So God told Moses, make a serpent of brass, and whosoever shall look upon it shall be read again. Yeah. So we, I'm not taking out the context. No, no. Come on back to verse 21 when you were there. Psalm 20. Six. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Come on. Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he look upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if any serpent had been any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. He lived. So now let's go back to John 3 14. Now we have the context. Okay, come on. The book of John, chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, you see, will. Hold on, you see the word as, and as, and as Moses, meaning the same way Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, meaning the same way, must the Son of Man be lifted up, must Christ be lifted up. Who did, here's a question, who did Moses lift up the serpent of brass to in the wilderness? Israel. You didn't have Romans there, you didn't have Chinese there, you didn't have Moabites there. It was the Israelites. Read it in its proper context. <laughs> Read it one more again, please. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have eternal life. So now we have a, there's some context that he's talking about Israelites. He's comparing Christ with Moses. Moses dealt with the Israelites. Now he's talking about whosoever, whosoever, who. Remember what he said to Moses. Whoever looks upon it shall be healed. He was talking about the Israelites. Now verse 16, one more time, one more time. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. So when you don't read it in its proper context, you start to include Chinese, Japanese, Eastern, all races on the planet Earth because you, you ignore verse 14 and 15 and just jump to 16. Read it in its context. Now, 16, one more time. I don't go through this song. But God so loved the world. Stop. Let's see who God loved. Here we go. I'm going precept upon precept, line upon line. Here a little. And there. That's how you read the Bible. Deuteronomy 7 and 6, please. Come on. I'm going right. Do you ain't even the Old Testament? The reason that God is holding a hoopla is because we keep ignoring the Old Testament. Come on. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7 and verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. You will realize that you are a holy people unto the Lord your God. We might not be living like it, but we are a holy people. Come on. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee 
to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Wait, 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 wait. Did that say equal to all nations on the face of the earth? Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. God says you are above all people upon the face of the earth. That equality thing from democracy, that's garbage. You ever notice they say we equal, but we always on the body? <laughs> oh, what's going so on over here? God says we are above all nations with your part of faith. So here, come on. A special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Uh -huh. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. God didn't put his love on you because you were the greatest nation, the most numerous nation on earth. Uh -huh. For you were the purest of all people. We were the smallest of all nations. Come on. But because the Lord loved you. But because the Lord loved you. You who? You Israelites. That's right. Come on. And because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. And he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. So now I'll go back to John 3 16. Brothers. I gotta read this one more time in this context. Come on. John chapter 3, verse 16. But God so loved the world. So now there's a problem with the word world. Because most of us, most of us, blacks and Latinos, we think there's only one definition for the word world. The word world has a few definitions. It can mean the cosmos, the planet, or it can mean a particular group of people having common interests, old aims, and goals. A particular group of people. Let's see what world that God so loved. Give me Isaiah 45, 17. Does, does God call us his world? Does he call us his world? Well, let me find out. Come on. The book of Isaiah, chapter 45 and verse 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded. World without end. What did he call us? World without end. The Bible says that you Israelites, you are the world without end. Now give me John 18, 20. Hmm. I'm going to switch the way the Lord you can in this context. Look at the word. Like, you, you ever look at the, you got an animal world, you got a sports world. Those are groups, particular groups of people. You got the animal world. What world was God talking about? John 18, 20. The book of John, chapter 18, and verse 20. Jesus answered him, I speak openly to the world. I speak openly to the world. Let's see. If he's talking about, he spoke to the Chinese, the Japanese, the Philistines. Who did he speak to? the world he spoke openly to? Come on. I ever talk in the synagogue, in the temple, where the Jews always resort. So the world that Christ spoke openly to is where the Jews always resort. What do we mean? The Bible. Now, give me uh, Revelation 21. I want the verse about the temple. It's just one verse. I don't have anything with Just find it. I got seven minutes. Come on. Revelations chapter 21 about the temple. And it had a name on it. 12. Revelations chapter 21 and verse 12. Everybody wants to talk about they want to get to the kingdom, right? We all want to get to the kingdom, all right? No, no. Watch this. And had a great, a wall great and high. And had 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. And the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. What is the name of the gates of what? Of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So in the kingdom of heaven, our names, our tribal names shall be written on the gates. Go ahead. Was that it? That was it. Now, now let me get some more. Give me Romans 9.13. Okay. I got to give Romans 9 for God to love the world. And pick somebody who comes behind us and say, hey, anybody, anybody, anybody. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you know what I've got? Whosoever. Do we, read, do we explain whosoever? Okay, let's keep it back in the I'll take a few minutes. Uh, the whosoever of John 3, 16, give me Acts 2, 21, 22, please. Who, the whosoever. The book of Acts. God told the world that he cares only for God, so the whosoever believe on him should not perish, but that in the last life. Let's see what that means, whosoever. Chapter 2 and verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever to call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, and hear these words. You men who? Ye men of Israel, hear these words. More racist. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. The Bible explains itself. Now give me Romans 9.13, please. For God so loved the world. God loves everybody. 
Somebody might say, oh, you guys are hate. You guys are filled with hate because you only love your people. We do only love our people. Yes. That's what God loves. Listen. It's a New Testament. A New Testament, by the way. The book of Romans, chapter 9 and verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hate. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jacob have I loved. You and Jacob, you and the descendants of Jacob. But Esau have I hate. So you want to tell me Esau got salvation? You got to know who Esau is. Ask your minister who's Esau. It's in the New Testament. I guarantee you. Not one of these Christian men doesn't know who Esau is. Just like they know Israel is. Esau, according to the Bible, is the so-called white man. The entire Caucasian race, according to Genesis 25 25, comes out of Esau. Give me now a one and four, please. I'm going to show you this more. I'm proving that God don't love all people. Come on. The book of Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 4. We're in. Edom say, Edom is the children of Esau. The entire Caucasian race. Come on. We are in power. Uh -huh. But we will return and build the desolate places. Uh -huh. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the yeah, they, shall, wait, wait. they shall call them Edom, the entire Caucasian race. They shall call them what? The border of wickedness. The border of wickedness. Come on. And the people wait. and the people against whom the Lord had indignation forever. The Lord has indignation against that people. For how long? Forever. Have you ever what indignation is? Anger. He can't stand them. He created them for a reason to punish us. What did we just read? The Bible. He says, the people against whom the Lord has indignation. For how long? Forever. Forever. So you ain't gonna now go to John 3 16 and go, well, the Lord changed his mind now. No! That's why Romans 9 13, one more again, please. The book of Romans, chapter 9 and verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Oh, so, 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 so. Give me, uh, what? Yes, Matthew 15, 24, one more time. Let's go right back. The book of Matthew, chapter 15 and verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sick, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the young man to tell me that Christ didn't know who he came for. You mean these preachers don't know who Christ came for? He's telling you out of his own mouth. He said, I'm not sick, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now what you need to find out, what you mean a general level about other sheep I have? The children of God scattered abroad. That one. Give me that one. Is it John 11 or John 16? Give me John, that one. chapter 10, verse 16. This is good, this is good. And other sheep I have, Christ said, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Which are not of this fold, meaning when Christ walked the scene, you have three main tribes in Jerusalem. Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. The bulk of the other tribes are scattered everywhere. That's what all that Christians don't realize. I do. Come on. Them also must I bring. Them also must I bring. And they shall hear my voice. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold. And there shall be one fold. And one shepherd. And one shepherd. So the children of God be scattered abroad. Was that it? Yes. So what? What happened to those scattered Israelites? Like we read in Deuteronomy 28 37. Remember it said that, um, let me get it right now. I've got a few little minutes left. It said that you would become proverbs and violence, right? Our nationalities are changing. In the New Testament, you read about Jews and Gentiles. That's explained in the book of Maccabees, where they forced many of the Jews to become Gentiles. Right. That's another thing. If you don't read the Apocrypha, you get to the book of Matthew, you're lost. Who are these Gentiles? All nations. No. It's the Israelites that was forced to become Greeks. That's why we've been forced to become American citizens. But we're really the Israelites. I hope all of y'all understand that thing right there. I want to read Revelation 7. If I could go all night, but let me end up right there. Give it all praise to the most high. Show up.
I got a minute left. No, you. I told you a minute. Twenty-two seconds. You deep? Just one thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, this is from the bottom of the picture with the scholars. The scholars of society put together. Come on, come on, come on, read that, read that. Eat them, eat them, figures. Eat them. Eat them, come on, bro. Eat them. Excuse me. Come on, eat them. Figures prominently in the prophetic scriptures as a scene of great future judgments. Seen notably in Isaiah 30, 34, 5, 6, 63, and 1. She is the only neighbor of the Israelites who is not given any promise of mercy from God. You hear what the scholars The scholars know the Edomites have no mercy from God. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Ha! Got him! Ha! Got him! <laughs> the next thing up is the Holy Scripture teaches. And Dr. Evans has emphasized the Holy Scriptures teaches that only the 66 books of the 1611 King James Version should be regarded as holy scripture. Dr. Maxwell. I count it joy unspeakable to have this privilege to speak a word from the Lord. I want to uh, first uh, cite uh, some things concerning the Apocrypha. And as you have read in your outline, or maybe on the stream about the proposition. My um, opponent did not really deal with the proposition that he had concerning the Apocrypha books uh, being on the same level a plane as the 66 books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's a brown book there, Brother Foster, and if you would handed to me, this, this is the 100th anniversary edition, the Holy Bible, the 1611 King James Version. And the people whom we are debating wanted to base much of what we say and teach on the King James Version bearing the Apocrypha books. And to my understanding, the Israel united in Christ, except the Apocrypha books as being inspired of God, just as the 66 books of the Bible. I want to just say something about this. I went through it very carefully. And interestingly, the Apocrypha is in the Bible, but it's not of the Bible. Oh! oh! Such a dumbass, I ain't making it. Bruh. It's in the Bible, but it's not of the Bible. <laughs> The Apocrypha is in the Bible, but it's not of the Bible. And I want to emphasize that too. Um, it's not of the Bible. And take note, even the uh, more than 70 translators of the new of the King James Version in 1611 did not give any kind of consideration for the apocrypha books that are between Malachi and Matthew. Isn't it interesting 
that the translators had a message for King James, uh, expressing appreciation to him being interested in supporting the King James Version 1611. And you'll notice also that the translators wrote a message to the readers of this book. Also, we find that there's an almanac featuring 12 months, all the 12 months, including morning and evening prayers and forecasts concerning weather and other uh, things. But interestingly, we find that the Apocrypha is in the Bible, but not of the Bible, because the translators said nothing about the Apocrypha. Isn't that interesting? If you're going to make this uh, Bible, including the Apocrypha in it, inspired of God, just like the 66 books, don't you think that the translators would have said something? But they didn't say anything. It's just there. It doesn't have a cover page over it. Like the uh, Old Testament. And the Old Testament emphasizes the fact uh, that Jesus Christ with a flap on them, that this is holy the Holy Bible. And they mention other things connected to that, translated uh, from the original tongues. But you don't find anything like that over the Apocrypha. Right. And so even when you come to the, uh, to the book of Matthew, there's a fact over there. The Holy Scriptures and that flap mentions the same thing that was over the flap of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. So the question is, why didn't they put it in the Bible? Why did they put it in the Bible, but yet it's not what? Of the Bible. That's the point we want to get across. It's because of the influence of the Catholic Church that the apocryphal books were put in with the other uh, 66 books. But none of the writers say that it is holy scriptural. None of them say the holy Bible when it comes to the apocrypha. But why is that? It's because the Pope uh, at a, the Council of Trent right. in 1546 had decided in that conference that the apocryphal books should be accepted as holy scripture as same as the 66 books in the King James Version. Now that's why they wanted to use this, because they used the Apocrypha in their teaching. But notice, we find that when it comes to the Apocrypha, that the Pope mentioned anyone who didn't believe in the Apocrypha would be called anathema. And that means that you you're going to go on your way to eternal punishment. Now that's how strong the Catholic Church was. But interestingly, once they took it out, the Apocrypha, then it's not in other subsequent King James Version. Why? It's because of the fact that the Roman Catholic Church needed to have something to prop up some of the doctrines that it has. 
For instance, uh, the doctrine of prayers for the dead and for sinless perfection. Also, it gives grounds for, for merit where a person can give so much money and earn God's favor, even to the point of relieving a, a lost loved one in purgatory from purgatory. And so, notice in 2 Maccabees 12, 39 through 46. And I'm emphasizing this so you can understand where I'm coming from and why these books are there. Now, they may be used for insights on the intertestamental period, the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, where no prophet of God prophesied during that time. So you can receive valuable information of what was going on during that time, but yet you can receive valuable information in other sources, but they don't have to be the Bible. Thereby, I want to read some of this to you, and the following, this is uh, in 2 uh, Maccabees uh, 12, 39 through 46. I would go through all of this, but I'm just going to make it very plain and simple here. And making a gathering, he sent 12,000 drachmas of silver to Jerusalem for sacrifice to be offered for the sins of the dead thinking well and religiously concerning the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that uh, they were slain should rise again, it would have seemed superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And because he considered that they who had fallen asleep with God in this, had great grace laid upon for them. It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. Now that's why, one of the main reasons why, that you find the apocrypha books in with the twenties, with the um, 66 books of the Bible. But you don't find that now very much, especially in the King James Version. Why? Because the apocrypha books are not inspired of God. As a matter of fact, you have Holy Bible over uh, the Old Testament. Holy Bible over the New Testament. But when it comes to the Apocrypha, it's blank. It just starts out with Apocrypha. And I, I think that even the, I knew, I know, that even the translators were not for putting in the Apocrypha. But they did it because of pressure uh, from the Pope. You can just sort of say amen to that. Amen. I wanted us to understand that part, but there's so much more that we can take a look at at this time to show us that the Apocrypha should not be used for doctrine, as Brother Evans indicated. Only scripture that's approved within the 66 books can we use to say this is the voice of God speaking through his writers, prophets, and apostles. I'm happy to say to you this evening that I'm glad to have this discussion. Dr. Evans has this and I have it because we wanted to make sure that you understood that we're not talking about something that we don't know anything about. And one brother called me and said, Brother Maxwell, what are you discussing? On, uh, I said, well, what are you discussing Apocrypha? I said, it's going to be on Thursday evening. He said, I'll be there Thursday. He wanted to know just that much about that. And how many of you want to know more about the pocket? 
I say your hands are raised. You've already found why it ended into the 1611 translation in the first place. And then even uh, uh, Jerome, who is a great uh, Greek and Hebrew scholar, uh, translated the uh, Catholic Bible into Latin. And so the reason that the Pope didn't want the, uh, the change from Latin is because he believes that only a certain type of people can really read and understand the Bible. And also, I want to emphasize a couple other things. Uh, notice the Apocrypha uh, teaches a number of ungodly things and practices. Take note, Take note of that. Of that it, teaches it teaches immoral practices, such as living, such as living, uh, I mean, lying, suicide, assassination, and magic incarnation. The apocryphal books themselves make a reference to what we call the Simon for whom it is, where there was no prophets to write who were inspired by God. So all the writings that took place during that time were written by men and should not be accepted as holy scripture. So when we say holy scripture, we're not talking about the Bible. We're talking about the six or six books of the Bible. And I want to dismiss a couple other things as to why we can accept the apostle. And that is and, and moving along here to make it shorter. We want to consider the fact while we are at this point, the subject of the Catholic apocrypha for which they make such claims and because of which they deny the Bible in common use by most brethren. The second Maccabees 12, 38 through 46 of course. And it appears that the Catholics still, I know they still believe in the Bible, that it's inspired of God. And that's why they want it in their Bibles. Even Jerome, during, during the uh, fifth century, when he uh, translated the, the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate Bible into Latin, but he didn't really want to do that. He did it under pressure. And the, also the apocryphal books were in the Latin Vulgate. But then, that's why the Pope didn't want this new edition to come about. Because it deals with the, the tongues and the language of the people. In sharing some more about it, take note that there are reputed to be 263 quotations and 370 allusions to the Old Testament in the New Testament, but not one of them refers to the Bible. Interesting, isn't it? And the usual division of, of Old Testament by the Jews, that was given by the Jews, was a total of 24 books. The book of the books of Moses, that's fine, the early prophets, 14, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, the late prophets, four, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12 minor prophets, and then you have Psalms and Proverbs and Job and so on. And but not the popular. Interesting, isn't it? Also, I want to share that they teach salvation by works in Ecclesiasticus 3 verse, where it says, Water will quench a flaming fire, and alms make the atonement for sin. Can you imagine? You can give money 
and your sins will be forgiven. A lot of people would get a lot of money if they thought that. Am I right about that? And notice, um, in total 12, 8 and 9 through 17, it is better to give alms than to live gold. For alms that deliver from death and shall purge away all sin. Again, that's Catholic doctrine. Then magic is called in COVID 6, 5 to 8. If the devil or evil spirit troubles anyone, they can be driven away by making a smoke of the heart, liver, of the, of the heart and liver, and all of the fish. And the devil will sin, but smell it, and flee away and never come again anymore. Wow. One minute. Uh, Thank you very much. And another thing I want to say before closing is that uh, when you get an unapocalyptic book and read it for yourself, but it's good to know what I call a lot of them. And I trust it will be helpful. And did the man come? Who said they wanted to hear about the pastor? The rich stand up if you hear. All right, that was Leon Ivory uh, came just for that purpose. They got that. Now, if you notice, Dr. James said a lot also, but he didn't really get his point proven in trying to debunk the apocrypha. In fact, he caused a lot of confusion especially by saying the Apocrypha is in the Bible, but it's not of the Bible. That doesn't really make sense. So we're going to have Bishop Kanaka come, and he's going to prove a little bit more why the Apocrypha is Holy Scriptures. Shalom, friend. Concerning what we teach, the Holy Bible, including the Apocrypha. I can safely say everybody here on this side of the room and this side of the room believes in our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Now the perspective might change. I have decided it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As he stated, all scripture given by the inspiration of God. All scripture. All scripture. Well, God described the coming of Christ. But I'm going to read something, and we're going to first touch upon the Apocrypha. Very simple. Let's go to St. John's, or uh, the first John, to say, first John, the second chapter. Um, and we're going to read what the Apostle John said concerning us believing and following on Christ. And then what's the Apocrypha. So, Captain Denise, 1 John, First John chapter 2, verse 3. The book of First John chapter 2 and verse 3. I want everybody to listen up quickly. Read on. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Understand what God's message is. He said that you know that you know Jesus the Christ if, if you keep the commandments. So the opposite would be, if you don't keep the commandments, you will not know Christ. Does everybody understand that? Yes, sir. Let's read on. Do you understand this side of Okay, amen. Let's read on. Verse 4. He that says, I know him, and keep it not his commandments, is a liar. So if I say I know him, but I don't follow the word of God, as is written, all scripture given by the inspiration of God, I would be a liar. So I will concede to whatever is taught. If it's based on scriptural texts, I must humble down and observe it. Read on. He that said he know him, I know him, and keep it not, his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him, and the truth will not be in that man. Read on. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, he that said he abide in him, he, one second, slow down. Whoever says that they abide in Christ, we don't, 
He that say he abide in him ought also himself to so walk. Even as he walked. So the message is here, if you say you believe on Christ, you abide in him and you would walk exactly as he walked. Is that not true, family? Yes, on this side, is that not true? Christ is our example. I want to make mention real quick that when we heard the doctor speak, one thing he did not do was give you scriptural texts. He spoke. He read from different articles and studies from other men with great esteem titles. But we're going to read scripture and prove that the Apocrypha is written. And we're not going to read from the Apocrypha. Because he said that you cannot find scriptural text, Old or New Testament, about the Apocrypha. Sir, you're grossly incorrect. Grossly incorrect. Let's prove. Let's go to the Gospel of Jesus Christ. St. John, chapter 10. Let God be true. Amen. As it is written. So we're reading from the book of St. John, the 10th chapter, and we're going to address the 22nd verse. The book of St. John, chapter 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, in the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. Now this is what it says. It says, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter. Read on. And Jesus walked in the temple and saw this boy. Wait a second. And where was Jesus? He was in a temple in Solomon's porch on the feast of dedication. Now I have a question. Christ said, walk as I will, follow my footsteps. Where would you find in the 66 books of the Bible the feast of dedication? That's my question. I'm going to pose these gentlemen. Show me in the 66 books, where would you find Christ Jesus, the one we all said we believe in, he found himself in the Lord's temple that he ordained for the Feast of Dedication. Where would you find it? Is anybody curious? Let God be true. Yeah. You will find it in the book of the Apocrypha. So, that means Jesus Christ himself was fool. No. We know better than that. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And that's in the Bible. The King James Version with all the books. So let's prove it now. Let's go to uh, let's go to first Maccabees. You know what? Before we go there, let's go to Daniel's the eighth chapter. Let's read the Old Testament. Hmm. We're going to read the Old Testament because you say it's not found in the Old or New Testament. We're just reading the Old Testament also. Remember, Scripture precept must be upon precept. Scripture on top of Scripture. With all due respect, when he spoke, he just gave you other people's commentary. This is God's inspired words. The book of Daniel is the eighth chapter. And I want the 14th verse. Let's get to the point. The book of Daniel, chapter 8 and verse 14. And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he said, so, so what was what was the vision that Daniel had? He saw the temple of Jerusalem destroyed by the Greeks, which you know today as Caucasian white men in the time of Antiochus. You would know Alexander the Greek. They came to Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. They set up idols in the temple. And it says it's going to be there for this second time until it was cleansed. Where was that found? Let's go to 1 Maccabees, the fourth chapter, in the Apocrypha, the book of David of God in which Christ himself observed. Uh, what verse am I looking for? 41. 40. Thank you. The book of 1st Maccabees, chapter 4 and verse 41. Then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress. Who was those in the fortress? When you read the Apocrypha, which I would suggest you do, because Jesus did it. That's how he learned with the Feast of Dedication. Read on. 
until he had cleansed the sanctuary. That's the same thing we read in Daniel. That was a prophecy that Daniel saw, that God inspired him to see. So we got to understand that Daniel was crazy. Daniel didn't know. God didn't inspire him. Christ was not the man with all wisdom, so he was wrong. The argument is false. The words of God is true. Read on. Verse 42. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law, you know, who had cleansed, who cleansed the sanctuary, who cleansed the sanctuary. Now let's go to 2 Maccabees, the first chapter. And I believe it's verse 1 and 8. Am I correct? No, 118. Let's read it up. The book of 2 Maccabees. Chapter 1, verse 18. Therefore, whereas we are now proposed to keep the purification of the temple upon the 5th and 20th day of the month Cassidy, we thought it necessary to certify you thereof, that he also may keep it. He, so the, the, the brethren that were in Jerusalem wrote to the brethren that were in Egypt and certified that they keep this feast day. This was long before Christ. And when Christ came on earth, what did he do? He kept this feast there. So how can we say that the doctrine is the truth? We're going to drop there. The point was made. So for them to say different, they would have to give you scripture, not reading from Google or page out of another book. If you believe on Christ, you would not be offended by this. Now, the question arises in my mind, with all due respect, gentlemen, why don't you know this? Why is it that they, for years of study, why don't you know this? Let's go to Psalms 111. So the purpose of what we're talking about, who we are, what we teach, to many of you it might seem a, a, a bracelet, but it's never meant like that. We're the prophets of God sent back on the earth. And we know this Bible with all due humility to the Most High God, but it's certainly not in my will, but He's using us. To bring forth a message. Let's read Psalm 111, verse 10. The book of Psalms, chapter 111, and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Read. And good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So, to have a good understanding of God's will, you must be doing his commandments. And why we go obey is because it's a commandment. And why we wear fringes because it's a commandment. And we keep the Sabbath day, we keep the temple, uh, the Feast of Dedication, the Passover. We don't keep Easter, Christmas, pagan, Mother's Day, pagan, Father's Day, pagan, Saturday, uh, Sunday worship, pagan. We find the days that God has set forth. In doing that, God said, what? Read from the top. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want wisdom, you must fear God. The reason why I have one wife. With all my truth, because I fear God. The reason why I don't steal murder is because I fear God. I fear his judgments. The reason why I keep the Sabbath is because I fear God. And in that, what happens? A good under what? A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. So those that do the commandments, God is going to give the understanding to. So what I'm saying, gentlemen, you need to refocus your attention. On the commandments of God. You believe on Christ, but not as Christmas scripture said, because Christ said himself, his words, that he found himself celebrated keeping the feast of dedication. Now, the bishops of Israel united in Christ did a great job of proving what they were saying using the Bible. And we hope that the video was edifying for those who want to know the difference between the truth and false doctrine. So, if you have any other questions, stay tuned and log on to Israel Unite to find out more about the truth of who you are. So I'm here, I'm here with Pops right here. Most High Christ bless. Thank the Most High, he put a spirit on us that we could bring out this word and pray you people repent that dad on Christian church. That's right. The Lord got the victory, not us. Remember that. Keep saying that. Shalom, Most High Christ bless. Officer Gabar, IOIC Las Vegas. Here for the first day of the debate, uh, the bishops did masterfully. The word went out. The Most High got the victory. All praise will come back tomorrow. We'll do this again. And by the way, these Christians try to get out of it. Just saying.
God. All praise the most high. Shalom. The first night, was, it was great, man. It was great. The bishop spoke well in the spirit, man. Christian, Pado, Christian pastor wanted to concede the scriptures. So all praise. The rock 24, I think it's 22. It said that we will confound everybody and we will not be confounded. We saw that tonight. Uh, the Christian pastors, they, they, they couldn't, they didn't stand a chance. All praises that we're able to follow these men of God. All praise to the most high. Day one of the debate, I think it went as planned, you know, the most high, um, he outshined everybody like he usually does, you know, it was, it was real edifying. I just pray that, that, that the people were edified because they were still amen and, and you know what I'm saying, even though they, they got the scriptures and everything, they still didn't, I don't think they grasped the hell to it, you know, but Lord's will, you know, they, they, they wake up out of sleep, you know. But as far as they won, I think it was a success, man. All praises to the Most High. Hey, Shalom Israel, Most High Christ bless. We just finished up with the debate Thursday night, the first night. Um, my thoughts on it are, are pretty, pretty, pretty smooth. I mean, we're, we're nice. Um, we, we remain unbiased as the Israelite uh, community. You know, we didn't get out the spirit. You know, we uh, showed love to our to our, our neighbors, even if they're in foolishness. You know, still stuck in a delusion, as the scripture says. We uh, showed compassion and we showed, um, you know, humility to them. So, Lord, will they repent and they, they learn from what they uh, heard this night. Shalom. I'm Elder Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets up. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, please make sure you subscribe to this Join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.